Hello! Um, so this is Otto Renier here. I'm super excited to be doing this Google Hangout on this fine Friday afternoon. Um, I'm a little bit closer than I usually am to my computer, so <laughs> I'm using a different computer. Um, but anyways, I'm super pleased um, to be talking about JavaScript today. JavaScript is totally awesome um, and the topic I don't feel like I get to talk about enough. Um, so today we're going to be talking about what JavaScript is, why you should learn it, um, you know, how it's useful to you, um, all the good stuff because JavaScript is one of the fastest growing, most marketable, you know, most popular programming languages that is out there and, um, and it's a really fantastic beginner language. So before we get to questions, and that's really the purpose of this Hangout, is for you all to get to ping me with lots and lots of questions about JavaScript and really push the edges of my JavaScript knowledge. Um, but first, I just wanted to talk a little bit about why JavaScript is so awesome and why I think it's such a good beginner language. So there's a lot of debate in um, you know, tech circles about what um, language is a good language to start with. And I think in general there's a lot of debate about, there's always there's sort of this ongoing debate about like, you know, should I know this language or that language? And a lot of it I think that is important to remember is that um, a lot of these questions and the answers come down to personal preference. So this question of should I know Ruby, should I know PHP or Python, um, you know, there's just, there's a lot of different ways to skin the cat, right? So, um, you know, you can build an application in PHP and you can build that same application in Ruby and Python and then some other crazy language. And it's really about, um, you know, trends and what's popular, what the market is asking for in terms of job skills. So, what types of opportunities are there in your area. A lot of this stuff is totally regional. Um, it's also industry specific. So there's a lot of different things that go into um, you know, making this decision. So the best I can do is sort of give general um, advice and then we can talk more about specifics. But um, the reason why I think JavaScript is such a great language to learn is that um, the number one reason is that it's, it's easy to get started. So one of the biggest challenges about languages like Ruby and Python is that it takes a little bit of setup to get to the place where you can actually start to use it. And it's unfortunate because Python and Ruby especially are such pleasurable languages to write in and they're really fun to learn and in a lot of ways a lot of people believe that they're really good for beginners to learn because they tend to be a little bit more forgiving um, and even you know a little bit more forgiving than JavaScript. But the challenge is that um, it's relatively difficult to um, get Ruby to work on your computer, for example. So even though Ruby does come installed with most Macs at this point, it's a relatively old version of Ruby. And then because of the security settings on your computer, you're just going to hit a wall relatively quickly. And it's basically, it's all stuff that can be dealt with. But you know, you ask people who have been programming for years and years and years, and they'll tell you that their least favorite thing about programming is setup. And unfortunately, you have to set up things before you can actually start to play with them. And then you get into this issue when you're setting out to learn a language that um, you know you can't even get to the point where you're learning because you're stuck in this hairy mess of trying to um, set this up. And this is like a really well-known issue, and it's a problem if you look on Stack Overflow or if you start to Google things. Like it's a it's an issue that people complain about all the time, um, and it's an issue that a lot of people are trying to solve. But the great news is that this isn't the case when it comes to JavaScript. So JavaScript comes installed, it runs in the browser, and it comes installed on every modern um, web browser. So um, there basically is almost 0% chance that your computer isn't already set up for JavaScript, and um, you are going to be able to use it um, you know, immediately without a lot of, a, without a lot of trouble. Um, I was getting some GChats, just want to make sure that I um, uh, Kelly's telling me to tilt the camera down just a bit. So tell me if that's better. Hopefully it's better. Um, anyways, 
So the first reason why JavaScript is a really great language is because you're not going to deal with any of that headache. You can literally, um, you know, if you want to open a new tab right now, you could start using JavaScript right this second with absolutely no setup time, and that's really awesome. The other good part about this is that because JavaScript does do stuff on the front end, um, and it allows you to manipulate HTML elements and do things like create slideshows and alerts and all that kind of stuff, um, you can really start to get a payoff immediately. And honestly, like payoff is important, especially when you're trying something new and different and hard. So the thing that's really great about JavaScript is that you actually um, will start to like see the you'll start to reap the rewards of the hard work that you're doing to learn something pretty quickly. Whereas when you're dealing with a programming language like PHP or Ruby or Python, um, there's just more moving parts and there's more dependencies, and it's going to take you a little bit longer to get to the point where you really have something that you can show off to somebody. So that's the first reason why JavaScript is a fantastic beginner language. The second reason is that um, JavaScript is super, super robust, and it's able to do a whole bunch of different things. And actually, it's interesting, because I noticed that a lot of the questions that I'm getting, and I can actually address these now, um, have to do with some of these new uses of JavaScript. So it used to be that JavaScript was really just used in the front end, which meant that it was um, run in your browser, and it would do things like, you know, do a slideshow and a modal and these kinds of, um, you know, parallax scrolling, like these kinds of things that we're used to seeing. So what's happened over the last 10 or so years, ever since the advent of Ajax, and um, Ajax is asynchronous JavaScript with XML, I believe is what it stands for, um, is that basically people are starting to use, JavaScript starting to creep, like, outside of the browser and, you know, onto the server. And so um, Ajax is basically a way to dynamically load data to your, um, your website using JavaScript, um, and so you didn't have to do repeat server, like you wouldn't have to reload the page, for example. Um, so then what's happened is people were like, oh, this is really cool. What else can we do with this? And, um, and then also, you know, of course, in all these stories, there's a million tiny little details. So JSON became really big, and JSON is a way to port data back and forth from your computer to the server. So basically, um, especially in the last like, couple years, there's been an explosion of um, what are called JavaScript frameworks. And that is actually, so I'm going to answer this question from Sandra Mayer. Um, so Sandra Mayer asks, what is mustache.js? And so basically, um, traditionally with web applications, or previous to sort of the advent of these JavaScript frameworks, um, there's this type of web application format or structure called MVC, and it's a model view controller. And uh, it's a really popular way to structure things, and it's actually the way that Ruby on Rails is structured. Um, and I use, and it's not, ex you know, people do it in lots of different ways, but I use this as an example. So basically what you would do is you would have the model, which would define um, the different aspects of your, your web application. So for example, if you were with a blog, you would have blog posts defined in your model. And then you would have views, and views are um, the actual HTML pages that get rendered. So you would, for example, have a view that was like the home page where you, um, you know, showed all the blog posts, and then you'd have a single blog post page, and then you would have this controller that basically ported data from the database into the view and displayed it for you. So what has happened is that, um, and but that view, if I was, for example, writing this in a PHP application, would be a PHP file that lived on my server. So every time you loaded a blog post, the computer would send a message to the server, and it would get um, that PHP template, and then it would render the HTML in my browser. So basically what have people have been working on is they've been creating ways that the views don't have to be served from the server. So instead what happens is all that happens is that JavaScript packages up, um, or your server just packages up this JSON package, and that can happen um, in a backend programming language like PHP or Ruby, or it can happen with Node.js, which is another question that I will get to. Um, and then it sends it as JSON. And um, if you guys take a look at it, the tech term that we have on JSON, we actually show you what JSON looks like. And then basically it gets um, delivered into the hands of a JavaScript framework or templating language like mustache.js. And that um, JavaScript, actually, so instead of the, the programming language on the back end deciding, you know, this data goes to this part, this data goes to this part, that actually happens in JavaScript. 
um, and the JavaScript generates these templates. So it would generate, you know, a blog post template or, you know, a landing page template. Um, the thing to keep in mind here is that in all of these instances, um, you know, there's always this question of, well, why would you do it that way versus another way, right? And to a certain extent, that's like a debate that programmers are having constantly. Is this way better? Is that way better? Um, and again, these things come into sort of this, you know, really hard. You can't really say, like, this is the best way to do it. It's all about, um, you know, what is the, your preferred method, what makes sense for your application, your situation, and all of those things. Um, you know, the benefits of using a single page web application framework like um, mustache.js isn't quite that. It's actually a templating. It's a way to do JavaScript templates, so it's not quite that robust. So I'm actually going to you know, answer this question from Todd. Um, but the benefits of using something like Ember or Backbone or Angular is that you basically um, offload a lot of the work from the server onto the client's computer. And what that can really affect, for example, is it can really affect the, um, the amount of load time that is happening. So often what happens is, is that maybe there's a lot of load time right at the beginning when the person loads the page, but then there's less load time um, in between. And so an example of something like this would be, um, it's very popular now that people um, had these sort of these media properties where you click between things and you'll notice that you're not actually loading the page again when you go between articles. Um, but maybe it took a little bit longer for it, the page to load initially and that was usually because um, it was loading all the data for all the different blog posts and articles at first and then because um, they're using a JavaScript framework they're dynamically loading each article as you click on it but you don't actually have to hit the server um, again each time you want that information. So another benefit for this is that um, hypothetically you could um, in some instances go offline and still have access to a lot of those articles. Um, and then to answer Todd's question about you know, the pros and cons of using Ember versus Backbone versus Angular, um, you know, I think that is a really good topic of discussion that goes outside the bounds of this discussion. Um, but um, a lot of these, again, it's about personal preference. It's about how complicated of a site you're using and sort of how much you want to write from scratch and how much you want to sort of have come out of the box. Um, I have only personally worked with Backbone and a little bit with Angular. Um, I have not worked with Ember, but I've heard really good things. But, um, you know, I my sense of Ember is that it's a relatively robust application, and it has a very specific way of doing things. So it's all about you sort of learning the Ember way of doing things and being um, comfortable with it. Um, but again, this these are situations, you know, you would use these frameworks because you wanted to create single page web applications where the user was not, um, you know, where the user was maybe able to interact or had sort of this very fluid um, experience where they could go between different states and, um, you know, and not be having to load new pages. And a great example of this that I know is an Ember application is the 2B app. It's um, 2TO.BE. And it's basically sort of this, like, you know, interactive canvas where you can do lots of cool things. Um, and it's just highly interactive without you having to actually, um, you know, create new pages and stuff like that. Anyways, I'm I don't want to get too hung up on single page web applications because it's a really big topic um, that merits its own entire hangout. Um, all right, great. So now I'm going to um, go to Rachel, and Rachel asks, I find learning JS a bit harder than learning HTML or CSS while taking lessons on CodeAcademy.com. Is this a common thing or I'm doing something wrong? Should I try another method of learning JavaScript? So this is a great question, and this is something that, um, you know, we think about a lot with our students, because um, a lot of our students, you know, have just come out of AF Skillcrush 101, and they're going into Skillcrush 102, and the truth is, is that, um, you know, I think the first hurdle when you're learning to code is just sort of getting used to the idea of code period and learning HTML and CSS. And then the second really big hurdle is really learning to program and understand programming concepts. And the truth is, is that um, they're hard. 
there, you know, and it's not impossible at all, obviously. Lots of people learn it, and you, Rachel, will totally get a hang, get the hang of it, but it is really new, and it's really different, and um, it's, I, you know, it's really unprecedented, I think. Like, I would imagine that you've never, you know, like, I had at least never experienced anything like that before, um, and it's a really different way of thinking about the world and all these things. So, um... I, you know, I'm a big believer in trying a little bit of everything, so I personally, um, you know, I do online classes, I read books, I attend seminars, like, I don't, I don't really think there's, you know, any end-all, be-all way to learn anything, I think it's just a little bit about, you know, sort of trying to absorb the topics and material um, in every medium, um, in every method that you find, and sort of feeling out for yourself, like, what makes sense to you, um, and it's also about giving yourself time. Um, yeah, I don't think that you're doing anything wrong. I think that you should consider trying a different method. If you know, if working on Code Academy is not totally working for you right now, um, why wouldn't you try something else? Um, you know, like pick up a book or join our Skill Crush 102 and see if that. Um, you know, makes sense for you, but sometimes, like I said, sometimes it's really just about, like, giving yourself some time and, um, you know, reading a book and doing some tutorials and taking a class, and then I think you'll, you know, you'll, if you stick with it a little bit, you'll sort of find that you have this, this light bulb moment where you're like, oh, it's all coming together now. Um, all right, so this is a great question. I, um, I'm afraid to pronounce your name. Juan Lee, maybe? I don't know. I'm sorry if I, um, I just know that people mispronounce my name constantly. Um, but anyways, he asks, do I have to master HTML and CSS before I can move on to JavaScript? So this is another really good question. This is something actually we've been answering a lot of questions by email about this. Um, okay. So it's interesting. And... Um, Okay, in my opinion, I think that it's really good to know HTML and CSS before you get into JavaScript. Now, you could literally learn JavaScript um, before you know HTML and CSS. And in the case of something like Ruby or PHP or Python, that actually could make some sense. Uh, but the thing is, is that JavaScript, at the end of the day, is a front-end programming language, and it is made for the web. And the web is all about HTML and CSS. And so I feel like you, if you haven't learned HTML and CSS um, before you move on to JavaScript, you just aren't, you're going to get to the point where you're going to be like, wait, I don't really understand the utility of what I'm learning. Um, because the answer is that the utility of it is that you can manipulate HTML elements um, and manipulate their styles. Now, do you have to be a master HTML and CSS? Absolutely not. So um, sort of a good rule of thumb that we have been using with our students to sort of assess whether or not they're ready to dive into JavaScript is we have a challenge where um, we, are, we teach people how to make a modal pop-up with JavaScript. And so this is sort of, you know, a great starting beginner JavaScript thing to, to do. So um, in order to do this, you first have to be know how to create a, a you need to be able to create a div and you need to give it an ID of modal. And you need to be able to give some styles so that it looks like a modal. And then you need to know how to hide it on default. And then um, you need to know what you would need to change in the CSS in order to have it show on default. Um, if you know how to do that with HTML and CSS, you're going to be absolutely fine in JavaScript. That is all the knowledge that you need. Um, you just need to be able to know how to um, give an element a class or an ID. You need to know, you know, what are some pretty common um, CSS style um, styles that you might want to manipulate, um, and that's really and just sort of the mechanics of that, and you're going to be totally good to go. So it's not at all like you need to be some HTML CSS virtuoso or anything like that. It's just like you need to understand what an HTML element is and CSS, and, and you know, have a couple properties that you know how to manipulate so that you can have some fun with the JavaScript when you learn it. Okay, so I'm going to answer a question from Christina. I got started learning JavaScript through the Skillcrush class, actually, fantastic, I'm glad you liked it, and everything was fine until we started in jQuery and I got really lost. Any words of wisdom? Okay, this is 
great question, everyone has such great questions, love it. Um, so I guess, Christine, I'd have to have a little bit more of a back and forth with you to talk about what is confusing about jQuery, but um, basically what jQuery is, it's like JavaScript shorthand. JavaScript, um, for those of you who have had a little bit of exposure to it, is really, really long-winded. It kind of like figures out how to, um, it's like, you know, where, what is the saying by like Hemingway? It's like don't use like 20 letters or words when you could use five. I feel like JavaScript is the opposite. JavaScript is like let's use like 45 letters when I could just use four. Um, and that's like really annoying when you're a developer and you're coding and you're writing lots and lots of code and you're just having to literally write lots and lots of stuff. So the idea behind jQuery is that it makes it possible to take advantage of all the amazing things that JavaScript has to offer, but you can do it without having to literally write so gosh darn many um, letters and lines of code. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think there's just general, I would say, like, you know, there's always general tips on learning um, and learning anything that's new. It's really important, of course, to have a community and to have instructors who you can reach out to. I mean, Christina, if you, um, first of all, you are more than welcome to rejoin us for our next session of Skill Crush 1 and 2, which starts on Monday. Um, and we would be so happy to answer all your specific questions and hop on a video hangout with you and talk through um, any sort of stumbling blocks that you have with jQuery. Um, yeah, so without sort of knowing a little bit more about your specific questions, it's hard to answer. But in general, I just think it's important. I mean, it's important to give yourself time. It's important to stick with it. It's important to ask lots of questions. Um, it's important to know that everyone struggles with this stuff. It's really it's hard for everyone to learn when they first get started with it. And if someone's finding it really easy, then don't worry. Like, you know, they're going to find something else really difficult that you think is really easy. Um, so I, you know, spend as little time as you can. If I can give everyone one piece of advice, it's like spend as little time as you can. One, figuring, like, debating in your head what to learn because honestly, like, anything you pick will be useful. Um, and if it doesn't literally become useful, it'll help you figure out that you don't want to learn that thing or that it's not useful, which is a great thing to know. Um, and the second one is like. Try to spend as little time as you can, like beating yourself up for not understanding something. Like sometimes things take time to sink in, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that at all. It's really important to remember that, um, you know, I don't know. Things take time, and it's all about just if you get there eventually, then you're awesome. And I think the only thing that makes you know, I think the only thing that's lame is when people give up too early. So don't do that, um, and don't give up because. I don't know, because it's digital skills are only going to become more important, and you're already ahead of the curve by even being on this hangout today. So, so good job, good job, Christina. All right, let's take another question. All right, I'm going to um, take a question from Nori92, and the question is: After learning JavaScript, how can we learn to apply it to our own projects? I feel like I have the Lego blocks, but I don't know how to put them together. Yeah. Totally. This is a big challenge. Um, so I think that, you know, in general, like, it's good to look at things out in the world and um, see if you can emulate them. That's always a really good idea, right? So, um, you know, you're like, oh, this infinite scrolling thing is really big, or I want to figure out how they do this thing where they say load more and it, it pulls some new stuff and loads it, or... Um, wouldn't it be cool if I was able to put the Twitter API on my website? I mean, I think a lot of this is just, you know, about trying to brainstorm. Like, even just take 10 minutes and write down 10 things that um, you think you can do in JavaScript, and it's totally okay if, like, you're not 100% sure, but just, like, go give us, give it, you know, a, just take a stab at it, and... Um, and then just hit them one by one. And, you know, the best thing you can do when you're learning after you've sort of learned the fundamental skills is give yourself projects and, um, and execute on those projects and learn the skills that you need um, in order to, you know, uh, put you know, accomplish whatever it is that you're looking to do. So this is something we think about a lot with our students um, in terms of, you know, like once our students graduate from our classes, um, how do we make sure to get them to keep practicing their skills and really start to build a portfolio of work for them. It's actually something that we've um, been talking about a lot internally um, 
And I, if you want to reach out to me by email, ada at skillfresh.com, I would love to talk to you, Noreen, more about this because um, it's actually something that we're trying to think about what, um, how we can help students like you solve this problem. Okay, so I wanted to um, answer a question from Krista. And she asks, will using JavaScript and jQuery give me the skill set to begin integrating, integrating with third-party APIs in my projects? And the answer is yes. Um, so first of all, when you learn JavaScript and jQuery, you learn you know fundamentals of programming. So that knowledge, in and of itself, will be super useful um, for working with APIs. Like you've got to understand how to deal with data and um, you know go get it and bring it back and do things to it and manipulate it. So that's to begin with. Um, second of all, there are a lot of APIs that are JavaScript based. Um, so we actually do a whole module in our class um, that is about APIs. And uh, I think we work with the Vimeo API because you can access it publicly without an API key. But I know also that the Twitter API uses JavaScript. And I'm pretty sure that Facebook has a JavaScript API. Um, and a lot of APIs in general, you know, have are sort of language agnostic. So they will allow you to use Ruby if you want, or or PHP. I, for example, was doing some stuff with analytics recently. Um, switched everything over from their JavaScript library um, for their API over to their PHP library um, for reasons that we don't need to go into here. But this is the point being that a lot of different APIs will actually allow you to use whatever programming language you would like to use. Um, so yeah. You know, absolutely, JavaScript and jQuery are fantastic, fantastic ways to work with APIs. And APIs are super cool, so I'm excited that you are thinking about them. All right, we have a question from Amy. Amy, I've taken Intro to JS for the second time now at school, and I bought a book to help me understand it better, but it is just not clicking with me. How can someone learn these languages when they don't have a job to apply what I'm learning to? So, um, you know, I think this is, a, I feel like my answer to this is going to be a little bit of a mix between what I said to Nori and to Christina earlier, which is that, um, you know, I think there's two things to think about. Um, one is that it sounds like you could really benefit from getting a, um, a, you know, putting together a project for yourself. And I know that that's, you know, coming up with a project is not always the easiest thing. I totally understand. So, um, you know, I'm, if you want to shoot me an email at auda at skillcrush.com, I'm happy to you know, try to brainstorm some ideas with you. Uh, maybe we'll do a Google Hangout later that's like, let's all collectively brainstorm some ideas. Um, but, um, but I do think it's also worth you know, trying different methods for learning something. Uh, I really do believe that if you stick with it, like you will get, there will just be this moment, and it's that aha moment where it all clicks, and you're like, oh, holy crap, what else can I do with it? Um, I have to say, personally, uh, one thing that has helped me, like, I've, you know, there was a point where I remember I kept, I was trying to learn Ruby, and I kept sort of going to these classes, and I sort of read stuff, and I didn't really understand it, and um, and then because of projects I was working on, I got really, really familiar with PHP and JavaScript, and then I went back to Ruby, and it was like, it was like, <laughs> like I just. I, like all of a sudden I saw it with a whole new set of eyes and and what was really amazing about it was because I was at that point very familiar with PHP and JavaScript I started to I was able to sort of immediately hone in on like what made Ruby different and special um, and that really I think accelerated my learning at that moment in time so I think that's something you could think about is maybe um, maybe you, you know take an online class about Ruby and start to sort of see how Ruby handles things that you've previously learned in JavaScript um, and see if maybe it makes a little bit more sense to you in Ruby and then it might affect the way that you understand in JavaScript. Um, that's just one idea. But yeah, so, um, you know, yeah, keep with it and, um, you know, even something as simple as like a blog, you want to create a blog for yourself or, um, you know, if you have a hobby, like, you know, I was talking to somebody who, um, you know, is, is thinking about creating a, a website where people can search for different health and wellness products. I mean, these are all fantastic ideas. Um, Learn so much from building it. So, um, 
you know, I don't don't think that any sort of website idea is too small. Like you'll learn something from every website that you build, um, especially if you start to try to use your JavaScript knowledge into it. Um, you'll get a lot out of it. All right. So I have a great question from Sherry Maple. Um, and she says, I can also be a bookish person. Are there any good reference guides for JavaScript and jQuery? There absolutely are. Um, there is a book that I love that's near and dear to my heart um, by Peach Pit Press that is called, I think, a visual quick start guide. I'm, I'm looking, I'm like, maybe I'll Google it. Um, a visual quick start guide to JavaScript. Um, it's very sort of... I, elementary isn't the wrong word, but it's very, like, you know, by the book. It's like, these are the JavaScript fundamentals, and it's a little bit dry, I'll admit. But um, I really found that going sort of through it and doing the exercises and sort of, like, you know, taking the time to go line by line really helped me to understand some of the core parts of JavaScript. Um, O'Reilly books are always a really great... Um, they're, you know, they tend to be really, really fun. I found a new imprint that I really like. Um, and let me tell you, I'm looking it up right now on Amazon. Um, they are books that are published by a company that is called No Starch Press. Um, and I haven't read their books on JavaScript, but I read their books on Ruby and really like them, really like the style. Um, so th those would be good ones. And then also... Um, we love John Duckett's HTML and CSS, and I see that he's coming out with a JavaScript and jQuery one, which I think should be really, probably really, really good if, it's, if HTML and CSS, if the HTML and CSS book is any indicator. Um, I don't actually have that book yet because I actually am not sure that it's published yet, um, but that looks very, very promising. So I hope that helps. Okay. Um, let's take another question from... Um, someone whose name I'm worried that I'm going to mispronounce, but let's just, I'll go with Cel Celestine. Um, asks, what exactly is Node.js and is it written in JavaScript? Yes, exactly, it is. Um, so Node.js is a way to um, use JavaScript on the back end so, and use it actually to run a server. So one thing that can be a little bit confusing is that Computers that host websites are called servers, but the applications on the computers that actually serve the websites, so actually um, provide you with the website and all the data and like, send out all that information, are also called servers. So what Node.js is, it's a, um, a JavaScript, I don't know if you'd call it, a, I think you'd call it a framework that allows you to create a server, the, you know, not the computer that is a server, but actually the application that does the serving. Um, in JavaScript. And what's cool about it is it's really, really, really fast. So a lot of people were really excited because um, speed is always a really important issue. Um, so yeah, so um, there's actually, this is like ridiculous, but there is a really cool website called DIY.org, which is actually for kids. Um, but they have these really great little tutorials about how to create a Node.js server that um, I think you should totally check out if you're interested in exploring a little bit more. Um, it's not, they're, you know, super simple, but um, I think they do a good job of explaining how to get started with Node.js. So, yeah. Okay. Got a question here from Rachel Smith. So Rachel says, I have a non-CSBA degree in anthropology. I have a mother who's an anthropologist, so I love that. And stumbled across a mobile UX research position stumbled across a mobile UX research position while applying to others online. Some friends say I should continue freelance study. Others say I should go get a master's or other schooling, which is best. So I guess my understanding of this question, Rachel, is that you're interested in applying for a mobile UX researcher position, if that's correct. Um, and it's funny, because as I was reading that, I was like, you know, that would actually be a really good fit for somebody with an anthropology degree. Um, you know, because, yeah, because user experience is all about thinking about how people live with something, especially like a mobile phone, um, you know, what the capabilities of it, how, how people interact with it, what the different sort of, you know, cultural norms are and how it applies. Um, whether or not to go get a master's, you know, it's really hard to say. Um, 
it really depends on what your goals are, and it depends on how much money you have to spend, um, and it depends on the market that you're in. I mean, there's like a million things. I have to say, from what I have seen, um, and there are exceptions to this, like there is a great program at NYU called ITP that I think is an exception to this, but in general, what I see is that um, the programs are behind the industry, except for maybe like the very, very top programs. Um, you know, and obviously you've got a challenge on your hands, and it's the same challenge that I face, which is that I don't have an undergraduate CS degree. So what would I be going, can I go back to school for a master's? Um, you know, do I go, I've, I know people who've gone back to school for CS degrees, um, but the problem with doing that is that, you know, unless you go to sort of a very progressive program, they're probably not teaching mobile stuff, right? So they're teaching computer science fundamentals, which are absolutely super useful um, if you're going to go work in tech and they're good to know, but they're not necessarily, like, applied. So the irony is, is that, yes, you'll have this, like, great foundational knowledge and you'll understand computer science, but you won't necessarily have, like, the skills um, yet that... Um, that you need in the marketplace. So in my experience, I think, I guess like the calculus for me has always been, you know, okay, yes, it would be really fun to go back to school, because school is awesome, in my opinion. It's probably why I run an online education company. Um, but it's always been like, you know, if I go to school, I'm losing the opportunity to make money while I'm in school, and I'm actually spending money to go to school, and will what I learn during that time period sort of make up for the fact that I'm both, you know, have lost wages of the opportunity cost and, you know, the new debt that I'm going to get. And um, for me, I it never really felt like there was a program that, um, that did that made that make sense. I think an option for you that you may want to look at is um, some of these boot camps. So these sort of intensive boot camps um, are a great option. I think for a lot of people, I think, you know, they're also expensive and they also require you taking time off, but um, from work and, you know, committing full time, but they, the, you know, they, they're not three years or two years or anything like that. So um, I think that is an option that you should look at. Um, and in the meantime, you know, take online classes, go to night classes. Um, I really do believe, I mean, the thing you have to realize is that there aren't programs for these fields because they're so new that they're being, like, literally created as we speak. Um, you know, like, this position in mobile UX researcher, like, probably didn't exist four years ago. So there really is an opportunity to sort of get in on the ground floor and help shape the industry and sort of determine, like, what is a mobile UX researcher and like what does apply and like I mean honestly Rachel like you could be like everyone needs anthropology degrees and like that's a legitimate idea um, anyway so I I think there's a lot of room for making it up as you go in the best way possible and and then I think it's a lot about you sort of figuring out you know when you're in the field like where what are the gaps in your knowledge that are really holding you back and then figuring out sort of innovative and inventive ways to fill those in for yourself okay I want to take this question from Angela and she asks how quickly do you recommend going from learning JavaScript to switching to jQuery and then adding all the toppings in for IE frameworks etc um, it's a good question but I don't know that I have the answer. I think that to a certain extent, I guess I would say that um, I'm a big believer in diving into things before you're ready and, you know, sort of opening it up and um, playing around with it and seeing how far you get. So honestly, like, you know, if you want to start playing around with Ember.js, you know, the day that you learn JavaScript, like, power to you and go for it. That said, I think it's um, a valuable exercise to take the time to really learn sort of the brass tacks of a language and really get good at it. So I just think that, you know, I just wouldn't recommend that you skip, that you sort of forego getting really good at sort of the fundamentals of JavaScript because you're so busy, you know, playing around with Backbone.js. Because what's going to happen is that you're going to get to a point where you really hit a wall um, in Backbone, let's say, and you're not going to have the JavaScript foundation to figure that out. And I think I just I think all I'm saying is like I just don't want you to get frustrated and give up on Backbone. <laughs> I want to set you up for success. Um, 
Yeah, but I mean, I I mean, there's no there's no doing it wrong. I mean, I think I think the only you know, the only place where you go wrong is, um, you know, is getting overwhelmed and running away screaming from your computer. Uh, so as long as um, you're not worried about that, then I'm not worried about you. You know, diving right deep into a framework. So go to, go for it, and then I would like to hear how it goes. <laughs> okay. Um, so we have another question from Nori, which is, um, how does someone go about getting an entry level, maybe internship after learning HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and jQuery? So this is a great question, and this sort of goes into a whole different, you know, can of worms that um, I know, you know, I would love to sort of talk more about and do. Maybe we'll do a dedicated hangout about this, but. Um, you know, obviously it depends on where you are. Um, it depends on your existing network. So, um, you know, I mean, you know, to start with, you can look at websites and see if they are advertising for interns, and then you can use whatever methodologies they've created for you to apply. Um, I understand that a lot of things like internships are not advertised for. So then it becomes about, um, you know, cold calling or cold emailing and saying, hey, you know, I love what you're doing. Um, I would love to work, work with you and learn from you. Um, I can speak to being someone on the receiving end of that. Um, you know, the challenge for especially small companies is that interns um, are hard to onboard and um, it's a big investment of time. So. I, you know, I think um, I'm trying to imagine a pitch that I would get from somebody who was looking for an internship from Skill Crash that I would really respond to. I think that it would really matter a lot to me that the person was really excited about Skill Crash. That would be really important if I felt like you were just spamming a bunch of people. Um, and the thing is, like, I'm not saying don't spam a bunch of people because I actually think you probably should spam a bunch of people. But it's really important that each each singular email that you send is super personalized and makes it really clear that you um, have thought about this company, you um, you know understand or have some idea for how you could help them. Um, look, I mean, there is a big need for people with HTML and CSS and JavaScript um, skills, and if you are willing to offer them, especially for free, that's attractive to people. So I would just, I would really start to just go out there and say, hey, like, here's what I know. Like, I will do the most boring crap for you that nobody on your development team wants to do um, just for the opportunity to ask questions and learn from your team. Um, I really, I think if you approach that in sort of um, a nice way and make it clear that you're not going to sort of I don't know. I mean, I guess you sort of have to think about what would prevent someone from wanting an intern. But I mean, free help is great. So, and I understand that intern not all interns are free. But um, yeah. Anyway, so I hope that helps. I feel like I wasn't totally prepared to answer that question. Therefore, maybe didn't send, give you the best answer. Um, okay. So this one comes from. See, I'm like now. I'm like terrified of. Just sing, just sing. I'm not sure. I'm oh, sorry. Um, okay, so she says, "Hey, Ada, thanks for doing this Q and A. After doing jobs from jQuery, can you then start looking at GitHub or other open source websites to play with?" Thank you. I hope this question makes sense. It totally makes sense. So, I mean, one thing I should say is that um, GitHub and working in Git, which is so, if for those of you who are not familiar, Git is a type of version control, and GitHub is a website where lots and lots of people use Git, the version control system, to store their code and share code and do open source code and collaborate on code. Um, so, Git actually doesn't. Um, you don't need to know any JavaScript in order to use Git. Um, or GitHub for that makes, for that matter. Um, obviously, a lot of the projects that you could work on in open source um, and stuff like that would require some programming knowledge. But um, but yeah, I mean, if you wanted to start learning GitHub today or tomorrow, um, you could do that just by knowing HTML and CSS. So JavaScript and jQuery are in no way a requirement for learning Git. Um, that said, you know, Git is you know, advanced skill, I don't know, but it's, you know, it's a skill that usually people don't learn first. So, um, you know, we teach it to students when they learn Ruby because it's really, um, you know, because often sort of working in the terminal and knowing Git can, can 
work side by side. And um, when you learn Ruby, you got to learn Terminal. And anyway, we're not talking about Ruby today. We're talking about JavaScript. Um, but yeah, so anyways, I would encourage you to, if you're interested in Git and GitHub, that's awesome. They're absolutely like professional industry requirement. You have to know how to use a version control system if you're ever going to work on any sort of development team. Um, and Git and GitHub are really what everyone's using. So it's really cool that you're thinking about that. Oh, so Nori, um, I just want to point out that Donna is looking for free, um, free interns at her awesome startup, Tasty Group. So start there. Email her. There you go. Yay, things are happening. OK. Um, John Stoner, uh, I think you're just making a comment saying this is a great resource for beginners. And oh, you are you posted an actual link. So yes, um, everyone take a look at the link that John um, included. OK. Um, I think that that's it. This um, video, Jody Hess is asking whether this video will be available, and it absolutely will be. Um, and I love it's funny. People are always, you know, talking to me about skill credit. Like when you run, you start a business. Everyone has all these ideas for ways, directions you can go, and things you can do with it. And it's always really fun and not at the same time overwhelming because you're like, you know, how hard it is to do the, the like the five things we already do. Um, but people are always talking to me about um, teaching high school students, and I would love to teach high school students. But it's always funny to me because I'm always like, yeah, you know, like I'd love to teach high school students, but like really, like I'd love to teach. Um, you know, like our demographic tends to be 25 to 45. Like, I would love to teach women who are 50 and over because, I mean, you know, like there's a lot of people right now who are thinking about high school students and how to teach high school students how to code. But, um, you know, who's thinking about everybody else? I am. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, we've got a question from Sharon Anderson. It says, this is a little off topic, but saw that someone just mentioned GitHub. Just a thought for a skill crush class. Finding that tricky to learn, or is it currently part of any of your classes? Yes, so Sharon, it is. <laughs> um, we are going to be teaching Git in our Ruby class, which is Skill Crush 104, which is going to be um, in May. And um, it's actually part of our web developer blueprint, but you can also um, enroll in classes individually. So. Um, Yes, yeah, so you should do that. And yes, Git can be a little tricky. Again, I think you know if it's like it's like there's different buckets of weird things that only exist um, in in web development, and I think version control is one of those. But um, it's super useful. Um, I mean, I, you know, for me, it's just like I'm so thankful because Git, I, you know, Git's confusing for sure, and I think I, you know, I tend to go back to my Git reference a lot, but. Um, I'm just so thankful for it because it just solves so many problems that we would have otherwise if we didn't have it. So, um, and in terms of um, resources, I mean, I guess like I would say like Git itself, GitHub, sorry, is a really good resource for learning Git. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. They did a thing with it was called like Try Git. I want to say it's like trygit.github.com or something like that. I think CodeSkill built it for them, and I thought that was a really cool little interactive tool. Um, you know, one thing that's funny about Git is that people have these um, software applications that you can download to use Git. And in my personal like experience, I find that just using Git in the terminal directly is easier. Um, but I think obviously, like if you haven't worked in the terminal a lot, that can be a little bit confusing to start with. But I think in the long term, it's it's simpler um, and more straightforward than doing it in any other capacity. Um, and that is absolutely something that we are going to be teaching in Skill Crush 104 and plan to also teach as its own class in the future. So, all right. So, if anyone doesn't have any more questions, this is your last chance. This is my last call for questions. Um, if you guys, I thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm so excited that there's so much excitement about JavaScript. JavaScript is such a fantastic language. There's so much to be done with it. Um, and 
uh, <laughs> I, I, I'll answer Jason's question here, which is, um, what languages would you need to know in order to sign up for your Ruby class in May? Um, I'll call you Jazz. There you go. Perfect. Love it. Jazz. Um, so you don't need to know anything. I mean, sorry, you need to know HTML and CSS, but you don't need to know any other programming languages um, to take our Ruby class. Um, I, you know, we had sort of designed the blueprint so that they're sequential, so they go, you know, HTML and CSS, JavaScript, and Ruby. So to a certain extent, um, some of the topics that we cover in the Ruby class will have been taught in the JavaScript class, um, which doesn't mean that you have to know JavaScript before you learn Ruby, but I just mean to say that I think we'll probably go through those topics a little bit faster um, than we might have if we assume that you didn't know anything or any programming knowledge, but I don't think that should stop you from taking the class. I think it just, um, it just means that you might want to take a little bit of extra time with those modules. Um, and um, yeah. So I don't think, yeah, you should do it. Ruby's a really fun language. Um, we're working really hard to make sure that it's you know, easy to learn um, and solve some of the problems I was talking about earlier that make it more difficult to learn for most people um, to get started with than JavaScript is. Nori has another question, which is, where can I find more information about your Ruby class? Um, we don't have anything up on the site. Well, if you go to the web developer blueprint, you'll find a little bit of information. Um, and we don't have anything up on the site yet, but if you sign up to be one of the first to know about our future classes, um, you will find out about it as soon as it launches. Um, and Shane, yes, this is being recorded for later. Um, I hope that means you enjoyed it. <laughs> um, Kelly has a question. Not related to JavaScript, but how do you recommend balancing taking an online class like Skill Crush 101 with a full-time job? Any tricks for alleviating screen fatigue? Um, it's a great question, and this is a challenge, I think, for everyone in this modern era. Uh, yesterday, I was like on my computer, and then I was watching TV, and I was like, oh, God. <laughs> this is like way too much screen time. Um, we try to keep it really um, reasonable so that it's something that you can do an hour a day. Um, you know, the, I can say that um, if you find the pace to be overwhelmingly fast or, you know, too much, um, you have forever access, so you'll be able to, um, you know, come back to it. Um, but I really do think that it's possible to do it in an hour or two a day. Um, so I think to a certain extent it's about sort of saying to yourself, okay, during these three weeks, I'm going to have a little bit more on my plate, but it's only going to last three weeks, and when it's over, um, I'll be glad I did it. And honestly, I also think that you'll find that it's really, really fun. Um, you know, a lot of people make a lot of friends in our classes. The community element of it is really fantastic. So hopefully it won't feel like you're just staring at your screen all day like, ah. Um, but it actually, like, the, you know, a lot of it is very inspiring and gets you excited about um, working on the web. Okay. So, um, if you're interested in actually sort of rolling up your sleeves and getting down with that good JavaScript, I would love for you to join us in Skillcrush 102, which starts on Monday. Um, you can go to the Skillcrush site um, and... Um, and find out more about it. Um, we'll also put a, a link in the comments. Um, and if you aren't ready to take, you know, to go into JavaScript and jQuery and feel like you need to brush up on your HTML and CSS fundamentals, then I would love for you to join us for Skillcrush 101, which also starts on Monday. And um, we will actually be running another 102 class in May, so you can go right from 101 into 102 um, and, you know, go get right into all the programming good stuff and get those skills that are crazy marketable. Um, yeah. So, and Nori, I look forward to hearing um, how things go with the internship. So, um, if anyone doesn't have any other questions, okay, I see one last question. Rachel, way to sneak it in there right before, um, before I was done. Um, and then, um, we're going to call it a day. Okay, so last question from Rachel. She asks, thanks for answering all my questions. I've been applying to some internships, our entry-level jobs. Do you have any advice for me with an anthropology VA trying to get into UI, XUI field? Um, 
and learning to code. Uh, so I think your question is, is I guess, let me put it this way. Um, do you think that it's useful to, or sorry, do you think that you are looking for advice on sort of how to land the job or what sorts of skills to have? Um, I mean, I'm a really big believer that no matter what role you're going to play in technology, that you understand sort of that you know enough code to be dangerous. And the reason for this is that um, it, there's just so much that goes into sort of the design and user experience design, especially of an application, and so much of that is influenced by the way that programs work and that programming works, and the way that data is shared and computers and how it's all structured. And I think that um, it's important to know that both from it's good both from a limitation standpoint because I think it's really common for designers to be like, why is this so difficult? It should just you know it make it work. Um, and understanding why things can be really difficult, but I also think that it's also for sort of understanding the possibilities. Like I really think that when you start to program um, and start to think about data and scale and sort of these things that make um, technology and programming really unique and unlike anything. I mean, the thing that's so amazing about coding and technology, right, is that it used to be like if I, you know, if I made a chair, like I can have you sit in my chair and you can think this is the world's best chair. I love it, but you're just one person. But the thing that's really amazing about technology is that I can build a website or a web application and 100,000 people, a million people, 100 million people can use it. And um, that sort of scale is really unprecedented in any other medium that we've ever as human beings been able to work in. Um, and I think that you can kind of start to understand that conceptually, but until you're actually really in the weeds programming and understanding that on sort of the granular granular level, like you just, you don't quite have access to really the possibilities of this medium. So um, so I would, I would encourage you to take the time to sort of get into that a little bit and I think you'll find that it really um, does affect how you approach user experience and user interaction. Um, so I hope that's helpful. Oh, and Steve, just to answer your question really quickly, um, it's called DIY.org. Uh, it's a really awesome website for kids. I like wish I had kids and could do stuff with them on that site. Um, my boyfriend is actually a, a middle school teacher, so I get to sort of live vicariously through him because he has all of his students on DIY doing awesome projects together. All right, um, if you have any questions at all about learning to code or whether or not you're, you should dive into JavaScript or jQuery or HTML or Ruby or any of these questions, if you want to brainstorm project ideas, anything like that, um, I just want to invite you. We're always here, always happy to chat. You can shoot us the entire team an email at hello at skillcrush.com. You can shoot me an email at Ada at skillcrush.com. I apologize if I'm a little bit delayed. I try to get to emails and answer them as quickly as possible, but sometimes they get lost in my email inbox for a day or two. Um, but yeah, and please, um, you know, just I just want to encourage you to be bold and go for it. And um, JavaScript is awesome. It's definitely hard. Um, you know, if you take our class, we're going to throw you in the deep end a little bit. We're going to be there to help you. Um, but, it, you know, you got to get dirty with these things. you got to get in there. you got to break stuff. you got to, um, you know, just experiment and bang your head against the wall and enjoy that process because um, you'll get a lot out of it. All right. So without further ado, I bid you all adieu. Happy Friday. Have a wonderful weekend. And I look forward to talking to you again.